Thank you very much for joining us here today. I'm uh, honored to be here, uh, especially because we're talking about my favorite subject, uh, investing in disruptive innovation. Uh, so this tagline, innovation is key to growth, it sounds very simple and logical, but the financial markets have lost the plot. Uh, what we've seen since the tech and telecom bubble and bust, and then the 0809 meltdown, is tremendous risk aversion, fear, and it's manifested in, um, in, in portfolios going passive. There's been a movement towards passive and indexed-based investing. Uh, and that's because uh, portfolio managers and analysts uh, believe that that is the safe thing to do. That's what they're measured against, are these benchmarks. Well, benchmarks are very backward looking. The stocks in benchmarks are there because of what has happened historically. Uh, and uh, innovation is all about the future. So there's a dearth of innovation and truly innovative stocks in traditional benchmarks. But our business has moved, has gone passive. And at the same time, uh, we've seen the largest asset managers, the Fidelities, the T. Rose, they have been looking, starting about six, seven years ago, for innovation in the pre-IPO space. So what's happened is a void has developed in the public asset management world. Uh, and that is a void we're seeking to fill. Uh, we believe there's been a massive misallocation of capital to these backwards looking strategies. And that the most undervalued part of any equity market today is innovation in the public equity markets. And I think one of the reasons we've grown so quickly is because viscerally, uh, our clients know this. They see their own lives changing so quickly and their children's lives. Uh, so, and they know that they're not invested correctly to capitalize on these changes. So innovation is key to growth means uh, we're not talking about growth by cutting costs or by leveraging up to buy back shares, which is financial engineering and which is ruining companies like GE, and IBM, and most of the, you know, the, the, the blue chip stocks of old. Will was kind enough to give you um, a sense of the firm. Uh, the one thing I'd like to emphasize about what we're doing is we've uh, set up the firm in a way that's very different from traditional asset managers. Our analyst responsibilities are not broken out by sector. And the reason for that is because we disagree with sector classifications. We believe that technology is blurring the lines between and among sectors. And even further, we believe that a number of the innovation platforms that are evolving right now, uh, and, and which I'll discuss in a moment, they are converging. We believe that traditional asset managers are going to have to reorganize, restructure their research departments if they want to understand the innovation that's evolving today and, and capitalize on it. Uh, I want to just say a brief word for, for those investors in the room and, 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 and those who have been hearing about this topic. Uh, many people, uh, portfolio managers, analyst strategists in the financial markets are very negative today. And the reason they are is because of this, inverted yield curves. Uh, inverted yield curves mean that short rates are higher than long rates. And that is an abnormal uh, circumstance if you look at this chart. And I, I'm sorry, this chart is somewhat uh, difficult to read. But the uh, line at zero, when this dark line drops below it, that means the yield curve is inverted, that uh, long-term interest rates have dropped below short-term interest rates. And every time in the last 100 years that that has happened, we've ended up in a recession within 6 to 18 months. Uh, and so they're very negative. Now, we've been saying since I started the firm, and we're on record, you can go on arc-invest.com to see this, we have been saying that yield curves are going to flatten and invert 
for a very good reason. It's called deflation. And many people hear that word and they say, oh my gosh, that's terrible. They, they're thinking of 08, 09. It's called deflation uh, caused by technological change. And we believe that's what's happening right now. Uh, the last time that happened, uh, and, and that it happened as, um, in as big a way, or nearly as big a way as it is happening now, was in the 50 years ended, ended 1929. And I'm going to show you a chart now that includes this time horizon, but also includes those 50 years prior to this. And you can see exactly the opposite. In the 50 years ended 1929, the yield curve was inverted more than 60% of the time. And that's because te technological change, telephone, electricity, internal combustion engine, was transforming the way the world worked, uh, was very deflationary in its impact, and was turbocharging unit growth. Now, during this time, you'll see that we were in boom-bust territory. Those gray lines uh, signify boom-bust. And the reason for that was there no, was, for the most part, no Federal Reserve uh, until 1913. And there was really very little government invention. So it really was boom-bust. And yet, innovation through that period caused uh, real GDP growth in the 4% range, on average, and inflation in the 1% range. So I'm going to skip through to uh, this chart. This is a timeline to give you a sense of what we are, uh, uh, are, are about to experience, what we are experiencing. Um, I mentioned the 50 years to, to, to uh, 1929, telephone, automobile, electricity. You can see the internet. We thought the internet was uh, uh, an incredible transformation of, uh, in our lives. And, and in many ways, it was. But look at what, and we've done a, a, a study, fairly rigorous, based on academic research, you can find on our site. Look at what the uh, change we are about to experience is going to do. Uh, if you liken this to a, a Richter scale and earthquakes, uh, you'd compare the early 20s, late 1800s, early 20s, maybe to a six-point uh, earthquake on the Richter scale. Uh, today, I think we're looking at something seven or eight, and each point increase is 10 times the amplitude and 30 times the power when you're talking about earthquakes. We believe that the transformation we are facing is going to be uh, quite provocative, and, is, um, and we believe that investors are not prepared for it. Uh, in fact, those who have invested in benchmarks, we believe are investing in value traps because of the uh, transformation that the companies uh, involved with these technologies are going to cause. Here are the five major platforms upon which we're focused. The seeds for these were planted in the late 90s, all of them, uh, but we weren't ready for prime time back then. Costs were just too high. These five major platforms are spawning 14 different technologies that we believe are ready for prime time now. Uh, and uh, to give you one example, DNA sequencing. In the bubble days, late 90s, early 2000s, we were sequencing the first whole human genome in history. And that, that actually did happen. And the dream of personalized medicine came alive. And lots of dreams started to, to come alive at that time in terms of the stock market. Investors were chasing these dreams. The problem was there was too much capital chasing too few opportunities too soon. And that caused the bubble. Today, we're experiencing the dream. It's a reality, and investors are scared to death. The yield curve is part of it, but a 10-year move up in the stock market is another part of it. People say, surely we're about to experience the next bear market. And are we not in a bubble? We are not in a bubble, I can tell you that. Uh, DNA sequencing, to give you that example, back in the uh, early 2000s, it took 
$2.3 billion, or no, $2.7 billion, and 13 years of computing power to sequence the first whole human genome. Even if that cost had come down in half the next year, we weren't ready for prime time. Today, nearly 20 years later, we're at $1,000 to sequence a whole human genome, actually less than that now. And we believe in five years we'll be at $100. And each of us will be going for an annual or biannual exam so that our geneticists can determine what genes have mutated in the last year or so, what genes have mutated in our bodies. And the reason they want, they want to do that is a, a mutation, which is a program er programming error, uh, is the earliest manifestation of disease. The disease may not show itself for 50 years, but uh, it's there, uh, gestating. Uh, wouldn't it be nice to find cancer in stage one? This is what we're talking about now, and we believe it is, it is becoming a reality now. Uh, so each one of these, DNA sequencing, energy storage, thank, thanks in large part to Tesla, Elon Musk, and what he's doing, robotics, artificial intelligence, and blockchain technology. Each, we believe, is ready for prime time, with blockchain maybe being the most controversial, um, and so uh, I'll be happy to get into that. I have a short period of time to go through uh, the big ideas associated with these platforms that we believe are, read, are investable. They're ready for prime time right now. Uh, deep learning. What ARC does is we size, we do a lot of original research trying to size opportunities and figure out where the unit economics are going to reside. Uh, and so just to give you a sense of how meaningful this is, in, if, if someone had done this uh, and, and in the first wave of computing around the PC, well, first the mainframe, the mini, and the PC, uh, by 1998, that uh, in the market was valued at $4 trillion. The second wave of computing, the internet, the next 20 years, is now valued in the market at $10 trillion. If AI, artificial intel intelligence, uh, is as impactful as the internet was, then this is a $30 trillion opportunity. And right now in the market, we believe uh, it is a uh, value today at $1.5 trillion. So if you do that compound annual rate of return over the next 20 years, that's a 14% compound annual rate of return. Now, we think it's going to be a lot uh, uh, faster or a lot more exponential than that. And the reason is it's going to be so much more impactful than the internet. The internet transformed media, it transformed retail. It did not transform healthcare or the industrial sector or the utility sector. Uh, AI, deep learning, is going to transform all of those. So we think there is a 25% compound annual rate of growth uh, to, to be delivered from uh, opportunities associated with artificial intelligence. Um, digital wallets, and again, these are summary charts. Uh, there's a, a huge amount of research that goes into this. I think we have the most comprehensive models uh, on anything I'm about to show you, uh, in, uh, certainly in the investment world. Um, mobile value transfers or digital wallets. We believe we will be carrying around our, our banks in, in our wallets or in our pockets. Uh, they'll, be in, uh, they'll be effectively our, our mobile phones. Um, in the United States, just to give you uh, an example of how quickly this is happening, um, we've got Venmo and Square nipping at the heels of banks, right? Uh, that's what banks think. Uh, Venmo and Square are about to surpass all of our banks, including JP Morgan, uh, with the highest number of digital uh, asset holders. Uh, so they, they, uh, they basically, um, their relationship uh, with, uh, with PayPal and with Square, the owners of Venmo and uh, the Cash App, is completely digital. Uh, we, saw the, we saw how quickly this could happen in China. In 2017, we learned that uh, 
or we, we were told that Chinese uh, mobile value transfers were $8.6 trillion. This was in 2016. I did not believe that. I said, wait a minute, their economy is $11 trillion. How can, how can mobile value transfers be 8.6 already? Uh, well, we learned a lot from that. We used to think that, uh, that the, the FinTech, this idea of FinTech, was going to touch every dollar of GDP around the world. So that was 80 to $85 trillion. Well, China has taught us that that was incorrect. You have to take into account the velocity of money, which is five times more, at least, than GDP. So we're talking about a 400 to 500 trillion dollar uh, opportunity, meaning fintech will touch that that much. And China was the first proof point. China today, that 26 trillion dollars, 24 trillion of it is China. China accounts for 92 percent of all of the mobile value transfers in the world today. We're not uh, embracing it as quickly because there's a lot of inertia. We have the financial infrastructure, but we are moving in this direction, and it is going to be a huge opportunity. Think about this. China, for in four years, one trillion to 26 trillion dollars in mobile value transfers. That's a 26-fold increase. Uh, what's really interesting about what we do is when we throw out those numbers to investors, they don't believe them. Uh, I told you I didn't believe them. But now that we are really digging in deeply, we are finding pockets of exponential growth that are pretty mind-blowing. This $55 trillion estimate for 2022, this was done at the end of last year, it's way too low. It's way too low. This is moving like a freight train or a supersonic jet or something more modern, whatever. Um, <laughs> Battery cost tipping points. This is uh, energy storage is, is going to transform um, our economies. We've built our economies on the industrial combustion engine. The developed world has at least. And that is about to change radically. And you know, this is the first time in more than 100 years that we've had this kind of a change. It is such a change that is very difficult to get uh, investors to understand how quickly this is going to happen. Uh, so to give you an example of that, uh, and it's all because of battery cost declines. Remember I say cost is the reason, always, always, always. That's where it starts. Uh, the technology and then the cost coming down. Um, so uh, three years ago when we started doing, well really th three to four years ago when we started doing this work, uh, the EIA made uh, an estimate for electric vehicles. They, they took it out to 2022. And their estimate then was the number of electric vehicle sales in 2022, on here we have 2023, but in 2022, was going to be 250,000 units. In 2018, this chart updated, would be nearly 1.5 million. That, that was just a two-year difference. They were making a projection for five to six years out, and they were wrong by orders of magnitude. Um, and we believe this is about to happen again. If we are right, the cost of an electric vehicle is going to drop below that, and this is the average electric vehicle, of a gas-powered car in 2022, and it's going to keep falling. So that in 2025, we'll be at 15,000 compared to 25,000 for the average gas-powered car. We are going electric, uh, not only because of cost, but because they're better cars. You can see our estimate for um, 2023. When the EIA was uh, projecting 250,000 units for 2022, our estimate was 17 million. We looked like raving lunatics. We have not changed that estimate. And you can see what we think is going to happen from 2022 to 23, 17 million to 26. Talk about exponential growth. This is going to be shocking for the transportation world. The analysts out there following the auto industry are value analysts. They, they cannot handle growth. Uh, it's just a different discipline within our business. That's how siloed we've become. But the auto industry, the electric 
auto industry is going to be a growth industry, the likes of which we have not seen since the Model T. So it's going to be pretty exciting. We think the autonomous taxi uh, opportunity is going to be even bigger. So uh, if we knew today who was going to win in the autonomous taxi network market, given the cash flow models we've done out to 2030, we, and which are, these are software as a service or transportation as a service models, very high margin models, we would be willing to pay $2 trillion today for those companies in the marketplace. Uh, you can see on the, the right-hand set of charts, ride hailing at the end of 2018 was valued at $240 billion. This includes Uber and Lyft, and they've since gone through a down round. So uh, ride hailing is not worth that much more. Many people think ride hailing uh, companies are going to be the autonomous taxi network providers. They are not. They haven't been collecting data. They're, they haven't out outfitted the cars with sensors to collect the data to train uh, autonomous vehicles. Tesla has. That's our number one pick. Tesla is one of the most maligned stocks in the stock market. And I'm one of the most trolled uh, portfolio managers on Twitter in the world because of Tesla. But our conviction here is it is our highest conviction stock. It is the largest position in our portfolios. It is a $40 billion company. And we think it's going for that $7 trillion opportunity in 2028. <laughs> that $7 trillion opportunity is bigger than the entire energy sector globally today, in the, in how it's valued. So that's today. We think because of autonomous vehicles, because of electric vehicles, that energy valuation, that 6.2 trillion, is going to go down dramatically. Next generation DNA sequencing. So last year, there were 2.4 million whole human genomes sequenced. That's half of all of the whole human genomes that have ever been sequenced. We are already in exponential growth territory because of the cost decline I mentioned earlier. We believe that 2.4 million will be 100 million in five years. Think about that. That's nearly a 40-fold increase, or roughly a 40-fold increase. Again, this is the kind of growth in healthcare that no one's expecting. Why is it happening? Because of deflation. Healthcare has never been characterized by deflation. These analysts who are trained in the traditional healthcare and financial services world are not going to recognize this world. So we think the next generation sequencing um, opportunity is going from roughly four billion last year with Illumina the most important, they have 95% share of that market, to 20 billion, so a five-fold increase in five years. That's a 40% roughly ca ca compound annual growth rate. Illumina just delivered a very disappointing uh, quarter. I think it was 1% revenue growth. That's a big disconnect. They're not cutting prices fast enough. We think they will. There's a little friction because academic institutions have to catch up with this, but we think the demand pull from the clinic is going to dominate here and really drive this market forward. CRISPR, gene editing. Uh, we have sized this market, just to give you a sense. I mentioned earlier the mutations uh, that, that geneticists will be finding. Uh, well, here is the promise for um, being able to edit, correct those programming, programming errors, edit those genes. Uh, the, first uh, the first human trials are taking place here in the United States, uh, and one of them is, and is pediatric blindness. Pediatric blindness uh, uh, is, um, is rare, uh, but it is caused by a single mutation. So this study is done on monogenic diseases, those, ca those caused by uh, just uh, one mutation. Uh, in mice and in non-human primates, uh, CRISPR gene editing has been able to correct the blind mice and the blind non-human primates and have them see for the first time. Uh, we're going to see if this works in human beings. We'll get some milestones this year. 
uh, and, uh, and they may even stop the trial if it, if it is working this year. Uh, we'll know pretty quickly. And uh, to give you a sense of how not in a bubble we are, there are three stocks that are foundational. They have the foundational patents for CRISPR-Cas9, uh, Editas, Intellia, and CRISPR uh, Therapeutics. If I had told investors in the tech and telecom bubble that these three companies would get royalties on the $75 billion of monogenic diseases that would be corrected in newborn babies per year. In the late 90s, I believe that would have been a 200 to $300 billion market cap opportunity for those three companies. Today, to give you a sense of how little this is being understood or recognized in the market, the three companies together amount to $5 billion in market cap. To give you a frame of reference, Apple is close to a trillion. These companies potentially are going to cure disease. Uh, we think they're going to be pretty highly valued long run. That $75 billion is an interesting number. That, that's the revenue per year for therapies to correct uh, these diseases. But they're only for one gene uh, caused diseases. Uh, monogenic diseases account for only 2% of all diseases. The opportunity here is so much higher than that 75 billion. Uh, we're already doing research on polygenic diseases. Collaborative robots, um, in the few minutes I have left, collaborative robots, uh, we believe, are the reason that um, ro the, the, the robot industry will see exponential growth. So the robots that we are used to uh, seeing are typically in cages, in auto manufacturing plants. They're very dangerous. Uh, collaborative robots will be outfitted with sensors and will be able to work alongside human beings. There are labor shortages around the world. They'll take the menial tasks that nobody wants to do or that just don't pay very much at all. And they will help to elevate uh, human productivity. We think human beings will oversee them and uh, be able to do their jobs much, much faster than they have historically. So we believe that uh, Teradyne is the, the uh, leader here. Teradyne bought a Danish company called Universal Robots. And we think collaborative robots will, become, will insinuate themselves into any industry, every industry. So you'll have artificial intelligence and collaborative robots and the fusion of the two. Um, and just to illustrate the convergence of these innovation platforms, just to go back to autonomous taxi networks, that's a conversion of robots, autonomous vehicles or robots, energy storage, they will be electric, cheaper, and artificial intelligence, they're going to be powered by artificial intelligence. Uh, Tesla, what kind of analysts should be following Tesla? Robotics, energy storage, artificial intelligence, software as a service, we need to restructure research departments. Uh, 3D printing, last year to update this chart, it was an $8 billion industry. We believe it will be a $90 billion uh, industry uh, in five years. Um, you can see the last updates for the various uh, forecasting agencies here. You can see a lot have just stopped following 3D printing and that's because uh, of the hype around consumer 3D printing, which is where it's not going to happen, uh, and the valley of despair. All of these stocks are down 80 to 90%. That's a great time to pick up stocks if you think you're onto something. Aerospace and medical devices are the killer apps for this industry. And uh, we think they're going to uh, be moving at an accelerated rate into the sweet spot of the S-curve during the next five years. Finally, cryptocurrencies. Uh, I just want to touch on this because there is some controversy, and I think many people are surprised to learn, this is Bitcoin, uh, that last year, away from trading activity, this does not include trading, there were $1.1 trillion worth of, uh, of transactions on the Bitcoin network. Now, we don't recognize that here in this country, but in emerging markets, uh, think Venezuela, think Zimbabwe, think any country that is destroying the purchasing power and wealth of its population. 
think any continent like Africa, where cross-border transactions are prohibitively uh, expensive. And you can see here on average transaction value, the average transaction value of these, uh, of these is $15,000. This is business to business. Um, and it is happening. It is burgeoning in other parts of the world. And it is going to open those parts of the world, open, uh, open them up to tr other parts of the world and trade and really improve a lot of these countries. Uh, what I like to say about what we do is we are focused only on disruptive innovation that's going to transform the world and make it a better place. And I think each of the big ideas I've just described is going to do just that. And we, our objective is to allocate capital in the public markets so that these ideas can scale. They'll never be able to scale in the private markets the way they, they will be in the public markets. So um, we have a very open uh, and transparent research ecosystem, arc-invest.com. Take a look at it. We'd like to share and have you share with us any of your insights as well. So thank you very much.